at the end of every ordination, the preceptor gives a series of instructions to the new monk. Start out with very practical issues. The four requisites the monk has to use. When you listen to the list, it reminds you of how much this really was an old wilderness tradition in the very beginning. You had to go for alms for your food, find old rags to stitch together to make your robes, live at the roots of trees, and take old urine as a medicine. Now the instructions list that there are other things that are a little bit more luxurious that you're also allowed. But when you don't have the luxuries, this is what you fall back on. And they go into other practicalities, the four things that a monk should never do. If you do any of them, you're no longer a monk. Having sex, stealing something that's worth more than was a bada back in those days, which is probably around twenty, thirty dollars now. Never kill a human being. Never lay claim to any superhuman or superior human states that you don't really have. All very practical instructions. And then it ends with a passage to remind you what this is all about, why we're here, why we have a sangha, why we have a monastery. And it's interesting that the teachings at the very end come from that last year of the Buddha's life. It starts with what are called the Four Noble Dhammas. Saying the concentration nurtured by virtue is a great fruit, great benefit. Discernment nurtured by concentration is of great fruit, great benefit. And when the mind is trained in discernment, then it gains release from what are called the effluents, these qualities that flow out of the mind, bubble up in the mind, and create a flood that it can often sweep us away sensuality, becoming, ignorance. So let's remind us that the whole point of this is freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the things we've been doing. That requires that we take a new view of our own minds. We can't just go with whatever the mind wants to think about. Because we realize that a lot of the flow coming out of the mind is pretty bad stuff. So we go back and we work on our virtue, so that our concentration will have great fruit and great benefit. The Buddha is not saying that you can't get the mind concentrated without virtue, but the kind of concentration you get is pretty dishonest. It's built on disassociation, denial, because when you sit down, you get quiet with the mind. Memories of things you've done in the past will come up. Sometimes you can remember some pretty bad things you did. The more you stick with the precepts, the fewer bad things there are to remember. And you have to have the right attitude to the bad things that you did do, but you realize that you can't go back and erase those things. And it's not good to pretend that they didn't happen, but you don't want to dwell on them and you don't want to get remorseful. Just remember, this is a lesson you have to learn. And then you spread goodwill, goodwill for yourself, goodwill for the people you wronged, and goodwill for everybody. But as for new things as you're going through life day to day, you want to make sure you stick with the precepts, because otherwise you start thinking about things you did that were unskillful, and you start putting up walls inside. Either you've got an open wound, or you've got the hard tissue of denial. And neither of those are comfortable places for the mind to settle down. So all too often what happens is that you close things off. You tell yourself it doesn't matter, or it wasn't really harmful, and it puts up a wall. And you're trying to see things in your mind. You don't want walls. And it's also important that you have this quality of integrity inside, because the Concentration is going to lead to discernment. You want it to be honest, and you want the discernment to be honest as well. 
And it's very easy to make up all kinds of wise-sounding insights. But it's not the genuine thing. The real insights are those that help you see that you've been stupid. You've acted in stupid ways, and you don't need to act in those stupid ways anymore. Which is why awakening is a chastening experience. So to get the mind ready to see its own stupidity, you've got to give it a sense of well-being. This is why your discernment needs concentration to back it up. Because otherwise it's just not going to want to hear about what you've been doing wrong. So you learn how to breathe in ways that feel really good. And when your mind doesn't have walls inside, it's able, it's able to be aware of itself all around the whole body. You're just sitting here breathing. Think of the breath as surrounding you. We talk about watching the breath, which sometimes is unfortunate. It gives you the sense that you are in one part of the body, close to your eyes, and you're watching the breath someplace else. Remind yourself, there's breath in your eyes right now, too. So if you think of the lenses of your eyes focusing inside the lens, the eye itself looking inside itself, you're heading in the right direction. And then think of the body, the whole body being bathed with the breath on all sides. Left, right, front, back, top, bottom. It's all around. When there's a sense of harmony in the body as you breathe in and as you breathe out, then it gives that sense of well-being that you're going to need. You feel well-nourished. At the same time, you get a sense of how you are fixing your own food for the mind. The Buddha talks about four kinds of nutriment. There's physical food, which keeps the body going. And the mind itself has three kinds of nutriment. There's contact at the senses, consciousness at the senses, and then your intentions. And when you're getting the mind concentrated, you're learning to feed off of good intentional food. And you see how the mind has been fixing its own food for a long time with its other intentions. And you get a sense of this is a lot better. And it's important that you learn how to appreciate the food of concentration, because you're going to use that appreciation to peel away your desire to go feeding off of other things. This is where the discernment begins to work. You could ask yourself what the other things you've been feeding on. Are they really worth the effort that goes into it? Because you're not only feeding, but you're also fixing your own food inside. By the way you breathe, by the way you talk to yourself, by the feelings you focus on, the perceptions you keep in mind. These are the processes by which you fix your food. So it's not like the food just magically appears. You play a role in fixing it. The question is, is it worth it? And a lot of insight is going to come to seeing that you've been a lousy cook for your mind. Feeding off of old scraps, feeding off of roadkill, whatever the mind gets fixated on. But you also realize you can develop your skill inside as a good cook. You fix food that's better and better. And as you develop more and more of a taste for this food, it does, and it does take time for this taste to develop, you find that this becomes your new attachment. And I don't know how many times you hear it said, when you're meditating, don't get attached to the pleasure of concentration. But as John Fung would always say, that's a good attachment. You have to be crazy about the meditation in order to do it well. In other words, every free moment you have. Try to be with the breath. Try to observe your mind in the present moment.
You might say you almost get addicted to it. When the mind is free, this is where it goes. That's what you want. When you have that kind of attachment, then it gets ready to the, for the point where the discernment is going to tell you, well, even this is not good enough. And if you try applying that discernment when you're not really attached to the concentration, it can destroy the concentration, make you not want to do it anymore. So get yourself attached. Learn to get really good at it, and then you can start analyzing it to see if you really want to rest. You have to have something that's not cooked, not fabricated, not put together. And where would that be? Pose that question in the mind. When the mind is ready, things will open up. You can't determine ahead of time when it's going to happen or what the insight's going to be. There's a passage in the canon where a monk goes around interviewing other monks who are arahants and asking them, well, what did you focus on that led you to awakening? And one monk said he focused on the five aggregates, another monk said he focused on the six senses, another said he focused on dependent core rising, another said he focused on the the six elements. And the monk got confused. Why are there so many ways of examining the mind? Well, the answer, of course, is that there are lots of different ways that people put their minds together. Just like there are many kinds of food. There's Greek food, there's Lebanese food, there's Persian food, French food. It's all food. But if you're going to analyze it, you begin to realize that not only are the ingredients different, but just the thinking behind each cuisine is very different. Years back when I was making a cookbook, after my first time in Thailand, we are putting together recipes from different Asian countries. And I talked to someone who was an expert in Indian food, and he says basically Indian food is based on the principle that every food has a poison that you have to counteract with different seasonings, different spices. And then I talked to someone who was an expert in Japanese food, and they said, well, the Japanese attitude is each food has its own particular strengths, and you want to bring out those strengths. So same ingredients, but put together in a different way, and also thought about in a different way. And it's the same with your mind. Each pe person puts his or her vision of reality, his or her vision of him or herself, together in a different way. Just like there are many different kinds of cooks. So the insight that's going to open things up for you is going to be an individual matter. Nobody can tell you ahead of time. There's a sad story about one Westerner who went to stay with the John Mahabua. And he asked the John Mahabua, what meditation topic is going to lead me to awakening? And the John Mahabua said, I don't know. And the Westerner took that to mean that a John Mahabu didn't know how to get awakening. Left. Was what he's actually saying is who knows what topic is going to be the one that opens things up for you? Or exactly what kind of insight will make the difference. But the basic pattern is the same. You begin to realize you've been feeding on certain things that you've been cooking, and you want to learn how to see that it's not worth it. And you want to get the mind to a place where it doesn't need to feed. That's when it's free. Years back I was thinking about wandering through parts of Zion National Park. And as one of the rangers there told me, he said, you can't eat the scenery. In other words, you have to carry a lot of food along with you. I suppose what it would be like if you could eat the scenery. You didn't have to fix the food. Everything was already there. That can give you an idea of the kind of freedom you have when you don't have to feed anymore and you don't need to cook anymore. You can go anywhere. Or as the Buddha said, you're released everywhere. Because that's what these noble dhammas lead to. Virtue leads to concentration, gives an 
integrity, solidity. Concentration, when it's all around, allows you to see things in the mind that you wouldn't have seen otherwise when the mind is narrowly focused here, narrowly focused there. And the discernment begins to help you see that you've been feeding on things, you've been spending all your time fixing lousy food. Now some of that lousy food may be pretty good, but still, there's no end to that. You have a good meal today, tomorrow morning you're hungry again, so you have to fix some more. After breakfast tomorrow, you get hungry again, so you need food later on in the day. It goes round and round and round, it just never ends. But the Buddha is saying there is a way to get so you don't need to feed, and that's what brings us all to an end. And it's absolute freedom. So think of that as a possibility. Because as I said, this is what makes the vinya we have, this is what makes the dharma we have. All the customs around the monkhood, all the customs around how lay people are supposed to behave. They're all aimed here. As the Buddha said, the flavor of the dharma, no matter what, if it's genuine dharma, it's like the ocean. The ocean has one taste, no matter where you go. The Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic. It's all salty. Whereas with genuine dharma, the taste is release. <laughs>